that neuron had to kick in. This wasn't hard for someone with a mind. So. Quitting smoking is easy. I've done it two or three times. Well, the first cigarette that I had, uh, you know, lit up the cigarette, and the first reaction was I started coughing and gagging. And, you know, I think when you're 15 years old, you really don't understand the consequences of smoking. The fact that your clothes smell, that uh, uh, your breath stinks, and your hands are constantly brown from the smoke is really of no consequence because you're just smoking. You don't think about those things. And they all have the nicknames, uh, cowboy killers, coffin nails, butts, burrows. I tried to quit cold turkey, but uh, for me, it really wasn't much of an option and, and never really worked. We moved to Pittsburgh. I was working for a uh, restaurant, and uh, there was a lot of stress involved with the restaurant. Uh, I was up to two and a half packs a day, which really equates out to about two cigarettes every hour. Whether I was bored, whether I was studying, whether I was drinking coffee or drinking beer, I always had a cigarette. There was an article in the paper about a smoking cessation group called Smoke Enders. Went to it, paid my $550 for the class. I eventually quit. It was uh, February 13, 1987. I stubbed out my last cigarette, wrote it down in my journal, and uh, didn't smoke for six years. Of course, I was uh, out with some friends. I was in Chicago at a trade show, and uh, I was at a bar, and I uh, thought, well, I'll just get one pack of cigarettes, and we'll just call it a night. Well, I spent eight bucks on the, on the pack of cigarettes, and the next thing you know, uh, I was hooked again. And uh, for the next six months, I was sneaking around the house, sneaking around work, smoking cigarettes, one day I was in my garage and I wanted to have a smoke and I sat down on my toolbox and took a drag off the cigarette and just felt that feeling again of the nicotine. And I looked down and there's my three-year-old daughter going, Daddy, what are you doing? And I asked her to leave and uh, I stepped out of the cigarette with my foot and just you know, put my face into my hands and started crying and that was the last cigarette that I had. I talk to my kids about smoking. I say it was the dumbest thing that I ever did. And, you know, I'm very upfront because they'll look at pictures and they'll see me with a cigarette in my hand or a cigarette in my mouth. And, and I'll just say it was one of the dumbest things I ever did. I don't expect you to do it, but if you do, you've got to realize that there are consequences associated with smoking. Smoke free, lungs are pink, and uh, the downside is that uh, every time I, I get a cough, I think about the hold that uh, cigarettes had on me and, and you know, I wonder why I ever started. Pretty powerful way to start a, a discussion on this topic. And I think that when Kim and I were asked to do this presentation, the thing we wanted to focus on is if it was so easy, anybody could do it. So what makes it so hard? And so we wanted to focus on the hard part, not just the why you should. So that's the focus of our presentation. Our objectives are first is what's up with this tobacco control measure? I mean, it's been in place since the Surgeon General's report, the first one in 1964. So everybody's known about this issue for quite a long time. What's the current rate in smoking in Ohio? Uh, I have people now saying, well, because of the smoke-free laws in Ohio, it's probably less, right? Uh, where can faculty and staff go for help? And also, our patients and families. Because as Larry mentioned, and also Dr. Pariser, it, it's obvious when you walk outside the organization, in fact, in front of our cancer hospital or our heart hospital, what do we see? People having a cigarette. And so we need to think about, rather than just enforcing the policy, what are the mechanisms behind that that make that so important uh, for individuals? So I mentioned back in 1964, the first Surgeon General's report, this is the Surgeon General, uh, uh, Luther Terry, at a press conference where they released the first results. And I want to read to you one of the, um, the findings of this report. 
The meeting at the National Library of Medicine on the campus of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, from November 1962 through January 1964, reviewed more than 7,000 scientific articles with the help of 150 consultants. The commission's report was issued on January 11, 1964, choosing a Saturday to minimize the effect on the stock market, to maximize coverage in the Sunday papers. As Terry remembers the event, two decades later, the report for him, quote, hit the country like a bombshell. It was front page news and a lead story on every radio and television station in the United States and many abroad. What did they find? Cig uh, the Surgeon General report held that cigarette smoking is responsible for a 70% increase in the mortality rate of smokers versus non-smokers. The report also estimated that the average smokers had a nine to tenfold risk of developing lung cancer compared to non-smokers. And if you were a heavy smoker, at least a 20-fold risk. The findings go on. So there in this moment is uh, a lot of people being first aware of the problem. Well, where did it initiate? This was fun. Type in on Google advertisements for tobacco and you find some really interesting ads. Let's look at a few of these. Gee, mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboros. Yes, you never need to feel oversmoked. That's the miracle of Marlboro. You're like a part of the family, doctor. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Over here, recognize that guy? President? He sends, Chris, instead of Christmas cards, he sends boxes of Chesterfield cigarettes. And look at this. Neat ad. Do the words gifted and talented mean anything to you? As she holds her prop. There's more. Luckies are kind to your throat. I know. I've smoked them for 11 years. More for your money than in any other cigarette. It's toasted. I don't know what toasted means, but he certainly was happy about it. I remember these when I was growing up. You'd rather fight than switch um, if you were using Territons. Uh, smoke a fresh cigarette. There's a, a doctor. Um, then we got the buff guy. I want low tar, but taste is a must. And then here's, if that one buff enough, try this one. If Bo Jackson takes up any more hobbies, we're ready. Um, very interesting. So people having words and theories and ideas about what smoking is. Scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people. 45% of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over 10 years. After 10 months, the medical specialist reports that no adverse effects now, would that be evidence-based practice today? Well, I'm not so sure, especially that might be a little source of bias. I'm not sure. Hey, Jerry, ask people how many of them recognize Any of these are people seeing? Arthur Godfrey, anybody know Arthur Godfrey? <laughs> <laughs> this looks like if you want to meet somebody, you might want to try that. Everybody's doing it. Don't your children say that? Everybody's doing it. And what do we say? <laughs> Lady with a lamp. They talk about Florence Nightingale, but it's really a physician in the picture. Shame on them. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So all this was leading up to the 1964 report, and one out of two Americans smoked back in 1964. So what was the findings? And now it's 50 years later. We have just had uh, the 50-year progress report. In the last century, cigarette smoking has caused enormous avoidable public health catastrophe. It has been the most. Despite significant progress, smoking remains the single largest preventable disease and death in America. The scientific evidence, you just can't um, uh, uh, claim that it's not true. Inhaling the smoke, particularly from cigarettes, is deadly. Evidence has linked smoking to diseases of all, almost all organs in the body. Greater risk of developing lung, lung cancer than did smokers in 1964. So even as big as that was back then, it's even more so now. And so you may ask yourself, why? Why is the risk of lung cancer today more um, um, insidious than it was back in 1964? The manufacturing of the cigarette as a delivery tool is very effective at delivering very high rates of nicotine into the body. For the first time, women are less likely to die as men from many diseases caused by smoking. 
are as likely, as likely. And proven tobacco control strategies are really multifocus. So our environment, our policies, and the treatment options that are available to people are all part of this tobacco control strategy. So what about today? Now decline in smoking has pretty much stalled. So although you saw graphs for a long period of time decreasing, now they're sort of flat. There are groups, subgroups that have a higher rate than they did before, more men, 24%. Multiracial adults, 30% smoke. If you're an American Indian, Alaskan Native, uh, 23%. Many of our smokers are below the poverty level, 31%. And interestingly, in 2009, one in five high school students smoked cigarettes, and most adult smokers, 80%, begin smoking uh, before the age of 18. So why do we care about the children? So then I thought, well, how do we transition this to all these national statistics? And if we want to look at, you know, we have an issue with Michigan sometimes. Ohio versus Michigan, we have a higher smoking rate than Michigan. One in four Ohioans smoke. And this is the distribution of states across uh, the U.S. You can see Ohio is here. Dark green is the highest prevalence down to those less. So we have a distinction in the country of having one of the highest rates of smoking in the nation. And if I get to my page, I can tell you exactly where we sit. I made a slide for it so I wouldn't forget. Ohio, percentage of adults who currently smoke, 25.1%. These are the latest stats in 2011. Across all states in the, um, uh, Washington, D.C., the prevalence is um, about 11.8 in the lowest states to 29% in the highest. So we're number 44th out of 50. Close to the bottom of the barrel, percentage of adults who currently use smokeless tobacco was 5% in 2011, and we're 34th out of 50 states, so less on the smokeless tobacco part. So what's the big deal? One in two adults who continue to smoke will die, and smoking damages every part of the body. And the issue isn't the smoke. The issue is what's in it. All the chemicals and additives that the tobacco country adds, and then this little thing called nicotine. There's its little uh, chemical um, abstraction. You can find out more information on that. Tobacco plants on the left, very big industry. Now, this is a lot of science, and I tried to make it as um, uh, applicable to what we're discussing as possible. But the science around nicotine as an addictive agent is huge. But I tried to pull off some key elements. The preeminent determinant of a smoking dependency in an individual is the nicotine. So the most important reason why people smoke is because that ingredient, not the smoke, not the handling, not the, all the advertisement. It's this, the nicotine molecule. Physiological processes of nicotine metabolism, excretion, and models of smoking acquisition and maintenance are part of this influence. So not only is it the compound, it's all the interactions in the body about it that make it addictive. Since 90, 1988, Designating nicotine, that was the first time they said it is an addictive substance. The properties have been further ratified by a variety of researchers. So in 1998, they said, yes, it's addictive, and further research has continued to prove the same thing. So what does it do? Nicotine dependence has these effects psychologically. Our, our colleague from our um, Tobacco Treatment Center talked about the behaviors. Dopamine, pleasure and reward, norepinephrine, Arousal, appetite suppressant. I know many women who choose to smoke to lose weight. Um, reduction of anxiety and tension. So remember when Jim in the video was talking about, I felt that feeling. When the exhale goes out, it's not the exhale, it's the nicotine interacting. Pleasure reward, arousal, appetite suppression, reductions of anxiety and tension. The addictive process starts with intent to use, initiation, experimentation, regular use, addictive use, all this. This is related to any other addictive substance known to mankind, not just nicotine. So it has the same properties of a process, not properties, process of addiction like heroin, cocaine, marijuana use, alcohol. The addiction to nicotine is an example of all these things working together 
And basically, once a person becomes addicted, the smoking becomes a way to relieve the withdrawal. So you create the sensation, but it's really to mediate the withdrawal. So one of the questions we ask on intake for people is, how long is it before your first cigarette in the morning? How much time? The heavier the smoker, the less time it takes in the morning to get up and light up. And when Jim Warner was talking about a a two-and-a-half-a-pack-a-day smoker, what he was describing is every hour, he was smoking about two cigarettes every hour, it's because he needed to dose himself to keep up with the nicotine balancing of the withdrawal and the buildup in his system, the pleasure reward. So he had to dose himself to keep everything even keel. So Larry introduced, we have uh, a new tobacco policy, and this is one of the uh, pieces of information about it. There is so much information for all of us in the university at this website, tobaccofree.osu.edu. That's where that video was. There's a lot of materials for clinicians. But now I'm going to turn it over to Kim, who's going to talk to you about, since we may have a better understanding or a more appreciative understanding of how difficult this issue is, what can people do about it? Hi everyone, I am from the OSU Health Plan and we provide a, oh, I'm sorry, I think I lost my slide here. Um, before I get into this, I just want to tell you a little bit about the OSU Health Plan. Um, we provide a wide variety of health and wellness services um, for the employees of the university and um, the medical center, um, one of them being the health coaching program. So I'm a personal um, health and wellness coach. I'm also a certified uh, tobacco treatment specialist. Um, So we work uh, telephonically with the members of our health plan to help them um, not only with quitting smoking, but also um, setting goals around changing diet, um, exercise, stress management. Um, We also have a Buckeye Baby program. Um, But for tobacco cessation, um, we've tried some new things recently, and we've just started um, a couple of groups, and we're still experimenting with them. Um, We've created a face-to-face group. It runs for um, six weeks long. Um, and that's where we'll have um, people from all over meet at one central location to participate in the group. And then we also started a new virtual group, um, and that is where the participants can actually see me um, and also Robert Meyer, who's the director of EAP. Um, But they also can call into a conference line, and that way they can help support each other wherever they are. So we have a lot of regional campuses, um, so we're trying to uh, get people from all parts of the OSU community to be able to participate. Um, So products that might help you with quitting smoking, there's two basic categories. You've got your prescription medications, which of course you have to have a prescription in order to um, get them and you have to fill it at the pharmacy. Um, That's more obvious. But then we also have the nicotine replacement therapy products. That's your patches, um, your gum, your lozenges, inhaler. Um, These are available over the counter. Um, But if you want to be able to use the benefit that the OSU Health Plan provides, you have to get a prescription for the -the over-the-counter meds and take it to the pharmacy and fill it that way, and we'll cover it at no cost. Um, So you get 100% coverage for both the generic and the brand name prescription products. Um, So that includes the Chantix, um, which is the most common one. That is the drug that's um, specifically designed, you know, just for tobacco cessation. And then we also have um, Wellbutrin which is an antidepressant, and Zyban, um, which is marketed just for tobacco cessation. So both of these are antidepressants. So a lot of our members um, are already on this for depression um, issues. So um, just depending on what their physician thinks is best for them, they can go with one of those options. Now for over-the-counter, this is also covered at 100%, and this is major. We just made this change uh, last February. So. Um, They don't have to participate in any programs to get this. All they need to do is just go to their physician or nurse practitioner to get the prescription. Um, There is a maximum of 90 days of therapy per year, and it's actually per uh, rolling year. So we offer coverage for the patches, the gum, and the lozenges. Um, The two that are not covered are the inhaler and the nasal spray. That may change in the future, but as of now, this is um, what the benefit is. Um, So just as I had mentioned before, how to actually get the cessation meds, um, we prefer that you go to your PCP, um, the person who knows you best, 
to get your prescription, but if you don't have a PCP, um, our members can actually go to a minute clinic or they can go to fast care or even employee health services here on campus to get their prescription and get their meds that way. Um, we do encourage people um, when we get questions about getting the medications and using the medications, there's a lot of research out there that proves that um, people that use medication and also use some type of support service, so whether it's a tobacco quit line or some type of group um, therapy, using the two combined, um, there are higher success rates with people quitting versus just choosing one alone or trying to go cold turkey. Um, so I mentioned before here the, the different options as far as the online, the face-to-face, -face, the telephonic. The telephonic has been the most popular. Um, we're having a lot of success with that because our hours of operation are anywhere between 7.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. Um, so we can talk to people that work all different shifts. And um, as long as they have a private place to talk, um, it's pretty convenient that way. The face-to-face, -face, of course, we run into some issues with um, getting people to come to just one specific location. It might not be convenient for everybody, but it is an option for our people who are here on main campus. And there may be some options later for some of our regional campuses to be able to provide some face-to-face -face services there. And then online is the one that I just mentioned. Right now we're titling, titling it um, a webinar, but it's actually like a virtual class where they, they can see um, the two facilitators and they can actually talk and interact. But then there's also the chat box option. So if they're at their desk, they are still able to participate just like a traditional webinar um, and have the conversation going without anybody knowing that they're, that they're participating, which is really important because we do have a lot of people um, that smoke that don't want other people to know or their coworkers don't know that they smoke. And this is a good option for them to be able to get help and no one to actually know what they're, what they're doing. Um, so this is a good link where you can go to find um, a program. Everyone is not comfortable coming to the health plan for whatever reason to get help. Um, maybe they want to do something on their own or in the community or a lot of um, our members of the health plan, they have spouses that smoke and maybe they want to do something um, away from work to get help. Um, so there is a link here um, that you can go to to see all of the, the resources that we have listed. That list has been updated, I think, in October. So it should be pretty current, but I know that we're coming out with a lot of new programs all over campus. So. There may be some deductibles and co-pays. There are a lot of free programs. Um, so you have to just go there and take a look and see what might work best for you. The programs that the OSU Health Plan offers, those programs are all free. There is no cost associated. We provide um, nice um, participant manuals for folks to use, and they can use that as a journal later. Um, we also provide um, like a Beat the Crave kind of pack, a little handy um, pocket pack that may include things like straws and gum and lozenges, um, things to chew on just to help them while they're trying to uh, quit. The phone number is listed here for individuals to sign up for individual telephonic health coaches. We have eight um, experienced health coaches that can all um, help people with trying to quit. And then I mentioned here about the group coaching, the web base and both the face-to-face -face also. There's also the EAP Quit Resource Center. This is another um, really great resource that you can go to. There's a lot of um, information available there for employees to see. Um, there's information on how to get in there. And thinking about which option is right for me. So um, I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, I've tried to quit several times. Um, the patch was itchy. The gum was gross. It made me nauseous. Chantix made me have wild dreams. Um, so each individual really needs to think about what their needs might be or what experience they've had in the past. Other things to consider um, is access and convenience, time, place, flexibility. So I kind of mentioned that as far as the, the services that we provide. That's why telephonic is so popular because basically anybody can participate in that. Um, some people do well with self-directed programs. Um, that's why we have both the options, the phone support and the computer base. Then some people like to be around other people so they can have that um, interaction and being in the same room with other people that are going through the same thing. Um, and then we start this whole self-coaching dynamic. They start to coach each other and then they don't even need the facilitator. And then I'm out of a job. So, <laughs> um, 
So small campuses and extensions. We can't forget about um, all of our extension um, offices and all the small campuses that we have. I'm getting a lot of questions from our individuals that work at these um, campuses about, you know, what, what's in it for us? We don't have any programs. We don't have anyone coming out here to help us, and we have a large population of people um, that smoke. So um, here's some information that we try to provide for, th provide for them. Um, but also, myself, Robert Meyer, we're trying to um, extend ourselves a little more to be able to get out there. But with only two people, it's really hard to, to reach everybody. But we try. Some external resources. You've got the Ohio Tobacco Quit Line. That's a, another telephonic um, option. They also provide um, NRT products. Um, you've got the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Society, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and so on. Um, we've got our phone number here for the OSU Health Plan if you have some more questions about coverage. So um, I know you guys heard Jim say on the video he's, you know, smoking, or trying to quit smoking is really easy. I've tried two or three times before. And that's the first thing I hear when I'm talking to someone who's trying to quit. I don't know why this time's going to be any different. This, I have one guy I'm working with now, he said this is his 23rd time. So he is keeping track of every single time he quits. And my first response is every single time you try, you're closer to being smoke free. You can't just, you know, focus on the failures. You have to look at what you've you've learned. So as you can see here, a lot of people, um, the average is about 10 to 12 attempts, depending on what, um, you know, research you read. Um, so you just have to keep trying, and that's what I'm here for. We don't cut people off. If they don't quit the first time, we don't say, well, you can't participate ever again. Um, we're here to provide support even after they quit to try to prevent relapse. So I'll go ahead and let Thank you. Wasn't that great, these guys? Thank you, guys. Uh, you know, I was remiss. I want Ben to stand up. Come up here, Ben. We have a representative of uh, the innovators, the Buckeye innovators, and also the, uh, of our colleagues, one University Health and Wellness, and it's Ben Van Trees. And Ben, Larry, and I, and Lauren, and Lana are going to make an offer for you that's going to include our friends over here. We're going to offer to make other presentations across campus with the same group of people if you want to set them up. Because actually the need to do so is, is greater, greater there than it is here. So uh, let Dr. Melnick know if, if there's an interest. We have, we have knowledge, we have voices, and we have great colleagues, and we're willing to travel. Okay, so thanks for all your work, Ben. I also want to say a little bit about Verena, uh, how do you say Verena Clean? Verena Clean, which is known as Chantex. Um, and the numbers of, bene of those who benefit from Chantex are incredibly high, actually. And earlier, there were concerns that it caused depression, but there's been much more evidence lately that shows that that's not likely to be an issue. So for people who are really uh, want to go beyond nicotine replacement therapy and health coaching or in addition to, um, Chantex is definitely an option to be considered. Would you guys agree? And so for people who are really hopeless about it and struggle and feel bad, that's something to, to think about. And more importantly, in, in closing my remarks, I'd like to say that I know most of you don't smoke. But you, many of you either have contact with patients or you have family members or friends who do. So this message is really for you to be health evangelists, to go forward. And the other thing to keep in mind is anyone who does not have the benefit of our health plan coverage is 1-800-QUIT-NOW is also a very helpful resource. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Larry, do you want to add anything to what I'm saying? You guys? right now and we're actually very happy to have that and this is basically the process 
Remember when I talked about a heavy smoker would need to, to have a cigarette within two hours? Um, or in Jet's case, smoking two cigarettes every hour. Imagine you come in through the emergency department and you smoke two and a half packs per day. And you have what is a typical length of stay <coughs> in our ED. What is it? What do you think it is? How long do patients stay in our emergency department? several hours. That's a, that's a low average. If you're going to get admitted, it's worse. But imagine by the time they get to an inpatient floor, they may be six, eight, ten hours into their hospitalization. If you need a cigarette every two hours to manage your withdrawal, what else is going on with you when you show up to the floor? You're probably irritable, a little bit touchy, you're not having the best attitude, and then some admitting nurse asks about your smoking history and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we're tobacco free. You want to strangle. So we wonder why people in gowns and the IV poles and wheelchairs go outside to smoke. Those nasty people. They need it. They have to have the nicotine to manage the symptoms. So the involvement of our interprofessional colleagues, when you know you have a smoker, get a consult, get those people up there. They ought to be having patches and spray and lozenges all over the place because something needs to manage these symptoms until they really get an intervention. I don't know if you ever saw that. Uh, I've done. I no, no. Go ahead. That one show where it was the guy who was like just this curmudgeon guy. He had a near-death experience and he was coming back to do right with everybody. And he lived in a trailer and I don't know. But there was a scene. What am I talking about? There was a scene of he and his mother-in-law deciding that they were going to quit smoking in the trailer. And they're watching TV for resources. And they have patches <laughs> everywhere <laughs> on their body. And they're smoking and saying, this isn't working. <laughs> That's probably not that funny, because Dr. Allen would teach me, as a pulmonologist, that just a drug, just the encouragement to quit, just Yes, well, that's great, uh, Jerry and Kim. And I'd like to ask, the, are the people from the smoking clinic, uh, smoking cessation clinic still here? Would you come up, please? Anyone who's involved in treating, uh, help those who want to stop smoking, come on up. Because I want you to be here so that if people have questions and they want to talk to you privately about getting in to be seen, um, they can do it. And, uh, yeah. Get, yeah, come on up. Come on up. Just come on up in case people want to come and talk with you. This is the first time, Larry and I were kind of marveling at this, that these people have all been together in the same room. So I think it's just great that that's occurring. Please fill out your um, evaluations on your way out. We're looking forward to seeing you on February 28th. Is that right? And uh, have a happy Valentine's Day. And if you have questions, please go ahead.